I haven't. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and come on in. We're going to get started. Okay, so today is the last day of our series on covenant. I know you are. <laughs> so as you guys have noticed from the sermon, Daryl is uh, Daryl's out of out of town this week. So no team teaching today. You're stuck with me for the whole time, and I deeply apologize for that. Um, starting next week, uh, Jeff Peters and Brandon Haney are going to be team teaching for about 12 weeks on um, followership, not leadership, not discipleship, but followership. And it makes a little bit of sense, because I don't know if you know this or not, but for the last two years, um, the primary course of study that we have been doing in this class has been on the kingdom. It has been kingdom focused. In other words, what is the kingdom of God? What was it that Jesus was coming to bring? What is my job in the kingdom? What is, my, what is it that God wants me to know? What is it that God wants me to invite the world to? That's what we've been talking about basically for about the last two years. So this book that, that Daryl and I have been going through, God's Kingdom Through God's Covenants, is really a look back from, I'd say day one, but let's just day six, <laughs> a look back from day six until the last day and saying, what is it that God had in mind from the beginning? And the reality is, and what we're hoping that you have seen through this study is that God's plan from day six to now and beyond has not changed. In fact, I'm going to be so bold as to say that the gospel is first told in Genesis 1, when God tells us what we are and what we're supposed to be about, when he calls us into relationship with him. Now, if you remember, we start the story of these covenants with the idea that the first covenant is a strange covenant because nowhere in the first few chapters of Genesis is the word covenant used. But it's a strange covenant because it's not a covenant that we get to choose to be part of. How many of your children got to choose to be part of your family? Now, if you're adopted, maybe you got to choose. Maybe you had some say. And we can even bend the story that way if you'd like. But the reality is, is the first covenant is the same covenant that you make with your children, which is, I'm going to love you no matter what. I may not like you sometimes, but I'm going to love you no matter what. And I'm going to support you, and I'm going to provide for you. And even when you are out on your own, not looking back, I'm still going to be looking for ways to help you. That's how the covenant begins. So today we're wrapping up with the new covenant. The New Covenant, obviously, is still the Old Covenant. But we call it the New Covenant because there's something fundamentally different about this, the way this covenant's going to work than the covenants that we had before. So other than the initial covenant between God and creation, somebody tell me what the next covenant is. What's covenant number two? There's a lot of water involved. Noah. Noah. Covenant between Noah and God. And in a lot of ways, the covenant of Noah, remember, is kind of a repeat, a redo, a reaffirmation of the covenant given to Adam. 
What's the covenant after Noah? Abraham. Abraham is important because Abraham is not just the beginning of a covenant between God and a person. Abraham is the beginning between God and a nation. And it says that through Abraham, what? All nations will... Okay? So it's not just a covenant for Israel. It is a covenant for God's kingdom. God is going to make a nation. It's going to be here. It's going to have a purpose. We know its purpose from Genesis. What were the two things that God made us in that we've been repeating over and over and over? God made us what? In his image and likeness. And what, is it, what does the image mean? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? To look like him? Now, again, physical appearance is rough, right? That's a, I can go, I can on one hand say, sure, and on the other hand I could say, not at all. Okay, what else, what else does image give us? Attributes. Do you guys remember this? Who's on the, who's on the front of this? 20. Jackson. What, remember, what, what does Jackson have to do with $20? Nothing. It represents the full faith and power of the government. It means that when I hold this, because of who the government is today, it's worth $20, right? So what does that have to say about who I am in the image of God? It's heir and lineage. It's, it's that I know who my creator is and I know where my power comes from. I know who I'm attached to. And I can have confidence in that. Okay? What was likeness? Remember we said, you're in a restaurant, kid does something really goofy, and mom says, he's just, just like your father. So what's, what is that? Help me out. What does, the, what does it mean, not image, but what does likeness mean? Yes, but it also means marching orders. It means that the way I'm going to treat people would be the way that my father would have me treat them. It means when I am out on business representing the family business, I am doing the things that our family business does. It means I am the representative with the authority because of the image enacting the things that the family business does. I, I, can, I can buy, I can sell, I can trade, I can make decisions on the fly. The way I treat people becomes a reflection back to who my father is. That's what we do. This is who we are and what we do. Okay. So if you ever have somebody ask you, man, why did God even make us in the first place? You can always go right back there because he says it. I made you in my image and in my likeness. And in that, we find the beginning of what Jesus is later going to call our mission statement, which is loving God and our neighbors. So I have a question for you, and as I've asked this question of somebody else, and, and he had the grace to tell me, hey, that's kind of a false equivalent question, and I said, I'm going to ask it anyway. So when Jesus comes, when Jesus is born of Mary, was he created in the image and in the likeness of God, or is it just redundant because he was God? Was Jesus created, was he born into the image and likeness of God, or was he God? Well, 
Somebody take one side of that and tell me why one side is true, and then we'll go back to the other side. Which one do you want to take? <laughs> so you take, you take your favorite one. OK, go. Okay. Anybody want to take the God side? Even at a young age. Um, just hold on. Hold on. We got somebody right here. Yes. Nothing that we are sitting these chairs, unfortunately, we're, everything that we have was made through Christ, through Jesus. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit were all there at the time of creation. And just keep in mind, I, this has nothing to do with anything else, but I always like to bring this up. Keep in mind that all of those things that happen in the Old Testament that we sometimes want to close our eyes and say, wow, I wish that hadn't been in the story and written down because that's really difficult to deal with. Jesus wasn't hiding in a closet when that happened. So when you say Jesus is the nice one and God's the strict one, it doesn't fly. Jesus was there through all of those things. So keep in mind, so keep this in mind. Jesus comes as God and gives that up. He gives up his deity to become fully man. Humbled himself to the point of becoming a servant. He does not come to show us how to be God. And you think about that for a second. Jesus doesn't come to show us how to be God. He shows us how it is that we are supposed to live in the image and in the likeness of God. So when you see Jesus suffering, when you see Jesus helping, when you see Jesus hugging, when you see Jesus encouraging, when you see Jesus lovingly rebuking, you're not seeing God, you're seeing God live as a man to show us, finally, what it is to be made in the image and in the likeness of God. And that's what the covenants were all about, was they were to draw us into this moment where we would understand, because God has to say things over and over and over because we're really thick and a little selfish. Words are hard. Okay? Words are hard. But yes, that is exactly what I said. And the way I mean that, the way I mean that is he was completely human. And, I'm, and now I'm going to speak for me. I'm not going to speak for the elders. I'm not going to speak for the church of, of whatever. But I'm going to say that when Jesus did his miracles, he didn't do it through his own power as God. He did it through the Spirit and through, and through God. That as human, he did not in, innately of himself have the ability to turn water to wine as I don't. Yes. Yes. And so the tension that we live in with that is real. And it is over my pay grade to totally tell you how that works. But God calls us to ponder it. And what's more impressive to me in pondering it is the realization that Jesus put himself intentionally into a position of weakness to show us what strength looks like. And I need you to ponder that. As I watch the news today and I see people killing each other and I get really angry and I want to go do something about it, it looks very different than when Jesus sees people killing people and offers himself as a sacrifice. And so I have to remember 
that I have a model of what it looks like, I finally, and this is what we need to be celebrating and joyful about, is I finally have a model to look at what does it look like to be living in the image and in the likeness of God, and I find that in Jesus. So let's go back so we can go forward. God enters into relationship with a person, with humankind, with a nation. After that, he's going to enter into relationship with a sovereign. Who's the sovereign? David. And again, that's a little bit outside of our familiarity. And then he's going to have the new covenant. But I want you to think through all of these covenant relationships. I know you know this. None of the relationships that God entered into covenant with with people before Christ, were ever honored, reciprocated, by the person or people that he entered into covenant with. So, God, through the Exodus, brings the people out of Egypt. Was he successful taking the Egypt out of the people? God takes people over the Jordan into the promised land. Was he successful in taking the wilderness out of the people who went into the promised land? God exiles the people into Babylon. Was he successful in exiling the Babylon out of the people? It never happens. It never happens. So in each of these situations, in the first one where where we don't really have much to say about the covenant, but from there forward, God enters into covenant and he says, I will be your God and, I will, and you will be my people and all of these great things are going to happen so long as you do what? Obey me. Keep my commands. Anything else? In gory detail. None of them are able to live up to their end of the covenant. The problem isn't with the covenant. The problem isn't with Exodus. The problem isn't with being brought back into the land. The problem isn't with God's not providing enough. The problem is me. The problem was Israel, and I'm, I'm no different than them. So I want to talk about, I want to do some reading. Um, can I get somebody, I'm going to read out some scriptures here, and I'd like for um, somebody to to grab them. Can I see a hand for somebody who can go to Jeremiah 32, 36 through 41? Who who can take Jeremiah 32, 36 through 41? Larry. Can I get somebody to read Ezekiel 37? Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Right there. And then the last one, Jeremiah... 31, 31 to 34. Ben. Anybody need that read out again? 15 to 28. All of the prophets, all the big prophets. Now, minor prophets aren't minor because they don't have a major message. They're minor because they're short. But of all the major prophets, um, Ezekiel... Isaiah, Jeremiah are all going to be talking about the new covenant. So, Jeremiah 32, 36 through 41. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. (coughs) Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, 
and I will plant them in this land of your faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Thank you. Who's going to do this? God, Yahweh, is going to do this. We can't fix the covenant. We can, we can move from exile. We can move from town to town, right? We can move from Babylon. We can pack up our stuff and move, but we can't change this because we take it with us. But God is going to say, look, I understand, and I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to fix it once and for all. Um, Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. Came to me, son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is to Ephraim, and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick. Sorry, lost my place. Take another stick of wood and write on belonging to Joseph, that is to Ephraim and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together in one stick so they will become one in your hand. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick, I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become, become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any other offenses. For I will save them from all their sinful backsliding. I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever, and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. Okay, so this is the Assyrian captivity. They're, the nations before the Assyrian captivity were divided, the northern territory, the northern country, and the, and the southern, you know, Judah and the north. And so God is saying, I'm going to bring them back together. They hated each other. I'm going to marry them back together. I'm going to bring them out of captivity. And then I'm going to do the next thing. So I want you to hear in all of these passages, it does this exact same thing. It says, I'm going to physically bring them back. And then after that, I'm going to fix the problem. The problem that has been unfixable up to this point. God says he's going to do it. Um, who has Jeremiah 31? Ben. covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
and they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So again, out of captivity and then fix the real problem. And one last time, we're going to Isaiah, Isaiah 54, 1 through 10. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear. Break forth into singing, cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Now, if you want to go back and read this passage, 1 through 10, again and again and again, you're going to find something really interesting. You're going to find almost every covenant that we've talked about referenced in 1 through 10. Can somebody tell me who the desolate woman might be? When you think about the covenants that we've had? Sarah. Sarah. How long does Abraham, I mean, how far out does Abraham have to see in order to see that his offspring are going to be greater than the sands or the stars? A long way. The answer is a long way. Is God just talking about Israelites? Is God talking just about Israelites? What could he mean by this idea of, of that the barren one is going to have more children than, than the, the not barren one? What could he mean by this idea of you're going to have to get bigger tent cords? You're going to have to extend the tent to the east and to the west. This is talking about the, ex the tent extending past Israel. This is talking about us being brought into the tent. This is talking about the covenant stretching beyond Israel all the way to anyone who wants to become part of God's kingdom. That's where it gets really numerous. Is after the whole thing is finally put together and the borders explode and the kingdom spreads So what has been the problem, review question, what has been the problem with all of the covenants up to this point? Man. We can't live, live up to it. And there's another problem, and that is that even if one man could live up to it, he's just one, I mean, don't we all have to live up to it? Not if he's the king. Who plays chess? Okay, 
So the way you win a game of chess is you capture more pieces than the other person, right? No. The way you win at the game of chess is you control more of the board than the other person, right? How do you win the game of chess? The king. If you don't take out another pawn on the board and you take out the, the king, what happens? You own the board. You are now the king of the board. Let me say a phrase and see if you guys can finish it. The king is dead. What does that mean? Somebody want to take a shot at what that means? There's a new king, and the new king is the country. The king or the queen, you could say, long live the, the, the king is dead, long live the queen. You could say the queen is dead, long live the king. But it means that the sovereign is the nation. Just because the sovereign dies isn't the end of the nation or the end of the government. The sovereign is going to be, the sovereign is the head of, the representative of, the nation. They have the power, they're in charge. And we see that with David, right? How David lives determines the success or the failure of Israel. Correct? Jesus doesn't just come as a man to show what it looks like to live in the image and in the likeness. He comes as a sovereign. He comes as a David to do what, can't, what we can't do, he does for all of us. Can I get somebody to read Luke 22:20? Who's got that? Go ahead. One more time. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So who is bringing about the new covenant? There's two parties involved. Who are the two parties? And? How about God? Yeah. So God's doing his part, and man has to do his part, and Jesus does it as man, as king, for his kingdom, for his nation. So he says, this is my blood which is being poured out for you. In other words, I have lived out my end of the covenant. I have successfully completed the part that none of you were able to do. And as king, I now complete that relationship. Therefore, it can never be broken because I'm always going to be king. I'm going to be king sitting on the throne forever. And I have lived up to the obligations that God needed in order to complete this contract. And that's how we get there. It's not just that one man finally got it right and he was God. It's that one man became, got it right and he became king and sat on a throne for a kingdom. And that's our Lord. And it's because of what he did that he was able to complete every covenant that was laid out in the Old Testament. He was able to complete all of the steps that had not been able to be completed up to that time. You can go from your house to this church building, but you can't atone for your sins. You can be taken from Babylon back to Israel, but you can't atone for your sins. Jesus, as king, is able to do that. 
So what do we do with this? Is this just a clever way to relook at the gospel story? Is this just a unique way to look at the, the story of the covenants that we've always known and come back and say, well, there it is. We just came back to the exact same place where we sit every Sunday morning and it means the same thing. Nothing has changed. I don't think so. I think the whole point here is, 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 is this. And let me say it in maybe kind of a strange way. What are the weighty issues of the gospel story? Are there weightier issues? What are the, what are the issues of salvation? What are the issues of not salvation? Are you, would you guys be willing to list the points this morning in this group that are, are not salvation issues? Would you feel comfortable doing that? Some would. Some wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. Because <laughs> I know I'd step on some of your toes. I know that some of you would say, oh, I don't know, I'd be really uncomfortable. I don't know if I could stay here if you guys didn't think that that was important. So let me not sweep the feathers. Let me just do this, because I think this is something that we can all do. Can we say that the idea that Jesus is king of a kingdom that we have been invited to be part of, that Jesus, as going from God in heaven from the throne and becoming man and living out the covenant, being our role model in the image and in the likeness of God and showing us how to live, could we take the idea that that is centrally what it means to be part of the kingdom, is to live and follow Christ? Could we take that and, and look at all these other things that kind of sometimes bother us or seem important to us? Could we take this one idea and elevate it? And could we hold that up as the central idea of what it means to be in this space, in this relationship with one another, and in relationship with our neighbors. Does that make sense? I don't want to argue these little things, even if they feel like big things. Because to me, a big thing is something that starts on the sixth day of creation and goes all the way through to the end and keeps being brought up over and over and over, and it being the one thing that we couldn't do, which is to live in the image and likeness of God, and yet now we have a role model to do that, and he says, come follow me. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. And as you said this morning, there's going to be, and as, and as Bob said this morning, there's going to be a moment, a terrifying moment. There's going to be a moment when Jesus stands up and says, many of you, and I'm not pointing to you, but many of you have said, Lord, Lord. But I'm going to say no. So if we're going to have a weighty issue, if we're going to have a priority, if we're going to know, right, what the main thing is, and if we're going to know that we're saved, that we're inside of God's covenant, then we better be motivated to be figuring out what it looks like for each and every single one of us, what it looks like tomorrow or this afternoon to live in the image and in the likeness of God. And we find that by looking at how Jesus interacted with people. We find that by seeing what Jesus did when he was under stress. And we find that by doing our best not being perfect. We've seen even in the Old Testament where all the judgment is that God says, I'm done looking forward. I'm done punishing you. I'm done turning my face away from you. I'm done withholding my blessings from you because it's going to be made right. So can we take that promise from God that is even uttered, that graceful promise from God uttered in the Old Testament by the prophets over and over about what Jesus is going to be able to do for us, can we take that and elevate this idea, this simple idea of loving God and our neighbors and make that first? Now we know how we access this covenant. We access it through Luke 22.20, which is that Christ poured his blood out for us and we access that blood through baptism. 
It is our statement of saying we are now entering, guess what, it's a, it's a, it's a blood thing. We're back to covenants. We enter into the covenant through the blood, not our own blood, but through the blood of Jesus. And once we've done that, and once we've agreed, yes, God, I am willing to take on your image. I'm willing to know who made me and why you made me. And I'm willing to take that authority and go treat my neighbors, my coworkers, this way. Even when it's hard for me. Even when it means I'm going to suffer because of it. That's the direction I'm going to go. And that's the confidence that you were talking about. I've loved this study. You know, they always say the teachers get more out of it. Um, I hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, I hope what you do is you can look back and say, I'm starting to get a better feel for what the kingdom is about. When people say, the kingdom, what does that mean different than church? Well, church is part of the kingdom. Certainly the assembly is part of what we do as kingdom people. But since day one, God has been trying to tell us who we are and who he wants us to be. And he hasn't changed that message, quite frankly, at all. So, um, Larry, could I ask you to kind of close us out in prayer? Jesus is Lord, that he is our King and our Redeemer. As we leave this place and as we go through this week, through your Spirit, help us to be your image and to act like you. Because it's in the name of our King we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So starting next week, we're going to take what we've hopefully experienced or learned in the last couple of years about committing to the kingdom, and we're going to look like we're going to we're going to look at over the next twelve weeks what it looks like to be a follower, and that's that's what we want to do next. So thank you. Uh, letting you out a little bit early.